Hey everyone, James with TFB TV, and welcome to the cringiest episode of TFB TV ever, and that's saying a lot considering we do mailroom. So today on TFB TV, we're talking about six Boogaloo loadouts. Are you guys sick and tired of hearing that word, Boogaloo? Boogaloo, 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 Boogaloo. I am, I'm, I'm sick and tired of hearing. It's right up there with yeet where like it got run into the ground. If you hear some guy in like a shooting vest who's like 60 years old saying it at your local gun store, it's not cool anymore, I guess. Um, but what do I know? So what exactly are we talking about? Well, Boogaloo, God, comes from uh, Breakin' 2, Electric Boogaloo. And I guess it was a crappy sequel of a crappy movie back in the 80s and somebody started referring to the American Revolution II, like the second or the next American Revolution as American Revolution II, Electric Boogaloo, which actually is kind of funny, but it did get kind of run into the ground, but what does it mean? It's like SHTF, shit hit the fan. Zombie apocalypse. Teotihuacan, the end of the world as we know it for example. Basically what I'm trying to say without saying is this is a prepper video. Unfortunately, this is a prepper video and we're talking about gun combos that you would carry into the end of the world as we know it. So a rifle and a sidearm. If there's a Soviet invasion, a la Red Dawn, if you have the collapse of, I don't know, the economy and martial law and people running amok and McDonald's doesn't have the Butterfinger McFlurry, just shit that would just throw people on edge and, and you're living in a state of chaos. The end of the world as we know it. What two guns would you carry if you could only have one rifle and one pistol? I'm not saying these are the best choices, but I came up with some pretty cleverly themed combos, I think. And they're all kind of practical too, so this video will have some merit as we discuss these different combos. And I just mentioned Red Dawn. No, not the shitty 2012 remake, like the OG with Emilio and with Charlie Sheen. That was a good movie, at least in my opinion. What do you have in that case? You've got like a bunch of kids or like high school age. Uh, students who have started up a resistance cell against a Soviet invasion. So, you know, boogaloo, more or less. So I'm naming this the Wolverine combo in honor of Red Dawn. The Wolverine combo is an AK-47 and a CZ-75B. Of course, both of those guns were in the movie, but they're not bad picks for real life. So what is really important for a firearm for the end of days? Well, you want something that's reliable, right? goes bang every time you pull the trigger, but you also want it to be durable. So not only will it go bang every time you pull the trigger, but it'll go bang a whole bunch of times without having to maintain it or change any parts. Of course, you want power, you want range. Those are also very important, but more importantly, perhaps you want mobility, especially if you're gonna be on foot, if you're gonna be moving from point A to point B, if you're gonna to need to carry supplies with you. So it's gonna to have to be a lightweight platform, but you're also gonna to wanna to have lightweight ammo, lightweight magazines. Finally, and this is one not everyone thinks of, how prolific is it? So if you need to pick up parts, magazines, ammunition at the end of the world, how easily are you going to be able to find those things? The more astute of you were listening to me rattle off those qualifications and you're thinking, AK, check, 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 check. The AK is an excellent SHTF option. Why? Well, it's reliable. Of course, you've got videos from TFB TV, from Andrew, you've got Carl Casarda over at InRange, proving that it doesn't exactly live up to the hype, like it's not invincible in terms of reliability, but AKs are reliable. Nobody's gonna dispute that. What about durability? They've gotta be the easiest guns to maintain. There are people in retirement right now who were child soldiers maintaining AK-47s when they were like 12 and 13 years old. Not a lot of parts, they're very simple, and typically they're made at these Soviet com block style factories. They'll have cooled hammer forged barrels, they'll have all steel components, steel receivers. So they're going to be not only reliable, but durable. Prolific, they're also very prolific. If you live east of the Atlantic or west of the Pacific, this is probably going to be your most prolific platform. Asia, Europe, Africa, you guys got tons and tons and tons of AKs. We got a bunch over here, but probably not as much 
as you do. So if you're in one of those countries or continents, great pick. Now the AK is kind of fair to Midland in our last two qualifications, that is mobility and power. Mobility, of course, you're going to be using more likely than not steel AK magazines, even though there's great polymer options, but 7.6239 is gonna be a little bit more heavy than say 5.56, for example. Not as heavy as 308 though. A bit of a compromise. It's also gonna be more powerful than 5.56, but it's only going to have maybe 30, to 50% of the range that 5.56 has in terms of effective range, even though it's going to be more powerful. So it's not as mobile. You're not gonna have great long range. The sights aren't really all that great. If you just have a standard AK, especially with a fixed stock, that's gonna be less mobile and probably heavier than most AR-15s. But all in all, an excellent choice just because of how prolific it is, how durable and how reliable it is, and you've got decent close range power. Of course, the complement has to be the CZ-75B, the all steel version, because when you run out of nine millimeter ammo, you can use this thing as a club. It's so freaking heavy. Just strap it to the end of a broomstick and knock somebody out, take their nine millimeter ammo, take your duct taped CZ-75 off your broomstick, boom, now you got a pistol. And again, if you are in Asia and Europe, the CZ-75B might be like your go-to handgun anyways. Tons of them over there. Both of those guns were in Red Dawn. Both of them would be pretty good options, so I'm going to call that the Wolverine package. Now let me throw a weird one your way. We got the FUD Prepper. The FUD Prepper is going to, of course, carry a 1911 and 45 and a Ruger 1022. What a weird choice, right? And I've actually read this. Um, I dabble every now and then in prepper literature just for fun, just to, to see what preppers think about different guns. And a lot of people have referred to the 1022 as kind of like the ultimate prepper gun because it can kind of get the job done. You can use it. If somebody gets shot with a 22, there's no medical care or whatever around. I mean, they're hosed. You can definitely, I mean, plenty of people have been killed with 22s. I'm sure of it. Uh, you can take out small game. So it's kind of like a, a jack of all trades caliber to an extent, but most importantly, you could probably fit 2,000 rounds of loose 22 in your backpack and still have room for your toilet paper, your sunscreen, your zinc for your nose, your sleeping bag, your waifu pillow, MREs, all the essentials. You're gonna have room in there. Try to hold 2,000 rounds of 5.56 or 7.6239 or 308. You're gonna get tired of that shit really fast literally. It's got mobility in spades. That's where the 1022 shines. Everything else, not so much. Power, of course, power and range, lowest of the low. You're talking about a 22, at least you're firing it through like a 16 inch barrel. So um, you could probably make some hits out to, you know, 100, 200 yards, but not have a lot of power when you get there. But that's why you have your 1911 and 45. Now your ammo for your 45 is going to be heavier, but presumably you're going to be using your 1022 for most of the utilitarian work. I guess the belief also is if you're a 1022 guy that you're not gonna be fighting a bunch of people, right? You're gonna be using it to survive. You're gonna be using it to take out small game and so on. You're not gonna, it's not gonna be like Mad Max into the world boogaloo. I guess it really just depends on how you do your boogaloo. Moving on to our next loadout, we're gonna call this like the modern day Sela Scout. So for those of you who are familiar with the Rhodesian Bush War, there's a lot of lore surrounding the Celis Scouts. These guys were like colonial special forces in Africa. They had FNFALs, they had Browning High Powers, they had great training and asymmetrical tactics, and they also had excellent shorts. They're out in the African Bush, living in their own personal boogaloo, right? As I mentioned, they carried FALs and Browning High Power. So the modern day Sela Scout, modern day shit hit the fan package would be the DSA improved FAL and a Sig Sauer P226. Now let me make my argument here. First of all, the FAL itself, it's similar to the AK-47. They both showed up around the same time, maybe within a decade of each other. But the FAL uses a very sophisticated but simple short stroke piston operating system. The FAL might also be 
One of the only guns that's easier to maintain than the AK-47. Very easy to break down an FAL, just pop the bolt in the bolt carrier group out, clean it. You also, unlike the AK, which used a long stroke gas piston system, the short stroke piston system, which I happen to like better in the FAL, is also fully adjustable. So if the gun's really dirty, if you're firing in hazardous conditions, you need to crank the gas up to get more recoil, but more reliability, you can do that and then you can crank it back down. The FAL is also a reliable gun, but it's a little bit outdated. At least most FALs that saw battle like before the 1970s, 1980s, you're talking about guns that have 21 inch barrels, they've got fixed stocks, they weigh a ton, they're big, they're unwieldy, you're not gonna be able to shoot one from the back of a car or something if you need to, you're not gonna be able to clear a building, I guess, if that's something you wanna do. It's gonna be difficult if you have like two feet of barrel in front of you the entire time. And it's, it's gonna be heavy and a pain in the ass to carry. Also, the FAL, very difficult to mount optics to, just like the AK-47. They had to kind of implement some workarounds if you wanted to mount an optic. So much like the Galil Ace is to the standard AK-47, the improved FAL from DSA is to the standard FAL. The DSA improved FAL kind of takes everything good about the FAL but brings it into the modern era. So you have a sturdy mounting platform on the top cover to mount an optic where it will retain zero. You've got a folding adjustable stock. You've got the ability to mount accessories, flashlights, vertical foregrip, so on and so forth. It's a lot lighter weight and a lot easier to maneuver by virtue of the folding stock and you can get it with a 16 inch fluted barrel. So you're getting all of the good of the foul, but none of the bad. Now, inherent to the FAL, you do have mobility issues with the ammo. I wanna say that a fully loaded 20 round magazine for an FAL with 308 or 762 NATO weighs probably the same, if not more than a fully loaded 30 round AR-15 magazine firing 223. Now the trade-off is you get a lot more power from that 308. Even though the 7.6239 is more powerful than the 5.56 that the AR-15 shoots, the AR-15 kind of ups the ante with longer range and it remains lethal and accurate out to longer distances. Well, the 308 blows them both away in power and in range. You could conceivably make a hit past 700 yards if you had an accurate enough FAL. And it would still have plenty of juice whenever it got there. They're also reasonably prolific, and especially in like South American countries, I think they're still standard issue for a lot of military and police. Your modern day Sela Scout is going to carry the SIG 226. Why? Because the SIG 226 is, in my opinion, a natural evolution from the Browning High Power. Of course, the SIG 226 evolved from the SIG 220. The SIG 220 was functionally the Browning BDA. They're virtually the same gun. The Browning BDA, of course, was developed by SIG and Browning in tandem and was seen to be the next step, the evolution of the Browning High Power. So you can kind of trace the genealogy of the 226 back to the Browning High Power but the 226 is gonna be more reliable, it's gonna be more durable, you can hold 18 plus one rounds flush fit versus like 13 or 15 for the high power, and it's just a better gun in my opinion. Moving on to our fourth shit hit the fan loadout, we're talking about the diehard survivor, I wanna call it, and that is a Steyr AUG and a Beretta 92. So why those guns? Well, obviously, duh. Die Hard. If it can make it through Nakatomi Plaza, then I think the Beretta 92 and the Steyr AUG are going to make it through whatever you put them through. But I also actually like the Steyr AUG a whole bunch as an option for like a survival scenario. It uses a short strip piston system with adjustable gas like the FAL. It's very reliable, very durable. It's reasonably lightweight, but it's extremely maneuverable because it's roughly the size of like a 10 and a half inch AR-15 when you have an 18 inch barrel on the AUG because the AUG is a bullpup. So the barrel is recessed into the chassis of the gun, which means you get a gun that's more maneuverable than 
an M4 or an M16, but you actually get better ballistic performance because you're going to have a longer barrel. If you use the version that accepts Stainag magazines, going to be very easy to find AR-15, M16 magazines, Daewoo magazines. It's reasonably prolific in Europe, of course in Australia where it's been standard issue, I think for a while for their military. You've got the ability to mount optics and accessories. I say don't sleep on the AUG. I think that that's one that kind of came out of left field. Most people wouldn't think about that as like a survival gun, but I think it kind of ticks all the boxes. And of course, this is the first one that I've talked about that takes 223 or 556. I think that might be your best caliber because you can carry a whole lot of it. It's very lightweight ammo. It's reasonably powerful in close quarters, but you can make hits out to like 700 yards probably with a Steyr AUG. It's only downfall really is probably the trigger and the fact that you know they're kind of expensive, at least in the United States and, and not that easy to come by. But other than that, great option. Of course, the Beretta 92 is an excellent option, served the US military for, I wanna say around 25 years. Uh, replacing the 1911 and ultimately replaced by the SIG P320, carried by John McClane in Die Hard Nakatomi Plaza, has a 180 degree ejection port. Great pistol. It's seen desert warfare. It's seen its share of hard times. So I think it's got a pedigree and would work very well alongside a Steyr AUG. Another thing to think about maybe is the fact that the Steyr AUG is the only gun on this list where you can replace the barrel without tools. I'm going to throw you a curveball and suggest maybe for another loadout, the Die Hard Survivor Mod 1. You keep your Beretta 92, but you use an H&K MP5. The H&K MP5, not as easy to maintain, I would say. It's not difficult, but not as easy to maintain as like an AK or the FNFAL. However, the MP5, very durable, very reliable, weak weak. It's no substitute for a full-powered rifle, even a 223 or 556. However, you get ammo commonality between your pistol and your subgun. So that's something that we haven't discussed yet. And the thing is, you only have to carry one type of ammo. You only have to find one type of ammo. That's it. So I guess that's a positive. I'm going to kind of fling that your way, see what you guys think of that. You know, what about ammo commonality? Do you think that would be important? Maybe. So the H&K MP5, is it an FNFAL? No, no, it's not. But it's not that bad either. Finally, we've got what I like to call the correct answer package, and that is the M4 and the Glock 17 or Glock 19. So the M4, this one's pretty easy. If you're in the United States, it's probably gonna be the most prolific rifle, period, end of story. Everybody is gonna have an AR-15, an M16, an M4, whatever. Easy to find parts, easy to service, easy to maintain. Of course, you can mount optics very well. It's extremely accurate. If you have a high-end M4, a lot of people really expect like one MOA out of an M4 or an M16, which I don't think is, is true in my experience. I don't think that you're like guaranteed one MOA out of these guns, but it, it's going to be very accurate by virtue of the fact it uses no true moving components forward of the bolt. So you don't have that harmonic distortion like you have with the piston fired guns that we have in this list. Think about that in conjunction with the fact that you can free float your barrel and you can have a very accurate rifle. You can make good hits out to 700 yards, maybe even further if you've got the right optic and it's easy to mount an optic. You can put just about anything you want on an AR-15. It's one of the most accessorizable guns out there like you can put a light on there you can put a laser on there you can put an optic on there you can put like a green egg slow cooker on there like a little mini one make yourself a little mini combat hamburger whatever a lot of people will say that they're not as durable and they're not as reliable as some of their brethren on this list maybe that's true you got a lot of small parts in an ar-15 parts that can break the lugs on the bolt face of the ar-15 are smaller than say like the ak-47 but it's still very easy to maintain very easy to replace those parts uh, should you have to, very easy to find a replacement. You can pop a new upper on there, pop a new lower on there, and it's very modular. You know, if you want something, I mean, you could probably carry a backpack with you with like a 10 inch barreled model 
and uh, keep like a 20 or a 24 inch model with you if you need something for like hunting or longer distance. So I think the AR-15 is probably the absolute best option for all of those reasons. The Glock 19 and the Glock 17, of course, like every police agency, I think it's like 70% of police agencies in the world use the Glock 17 or the Glock 19. Easy to find parts like you'll ever need them because it's the most durable and reliable gun in the world. I know you guys are throwing up right now. Um, I am a Glock fanboy, admittedly. So I think that that would be a great option. And I guess if I had to pick one to be the combo, the Boogaloo combo, <laughs> um, I guess if I had to pick one to be the combo, the Boogaloo <laughs> combo um, for me, it would, I'd be Boogalooing, booging my balls off with the AR-15 and the Glock 17 or the Glock 19. Um, did you guys like this video? Maybe I'm gonna drop a little poll. I think I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna drop a little poll in the description right at the top. You guys click that. Tell me what combo you think is best and I'll even put a little comment section in there so you guys can suggest combos. If this video does well enough, mark my words, if this video gets 60,000 views in its first 30 days, I will do a sequel and I will integrate your suggestions if they're clever. I have to say thank you a ton, of course, to you guys for watching. Thank you to our Patreon supporters who keep this channel afloat. Thank you to Ventura Munitions. They are your number one boogaloo supplier if you need ammo, tannerite, whatever, uh, for the impending end of the world. And of course, if you find yourself in Mad Max Thunderdome with a blue Alpha Gear belt, you might die but that belt won't. So they make the best belts out there. Go pay them a visit, guys. Thanks again. Hope you enjoyed this cringeworthy video. See you next week.